This is session five, the Foundations of Finance module. And in this session, we want to build on the concept of risk by going from risk aversion, which is what we talked about in the last session, to measures of risk. Let's first talk about why we spent so much time on the question of whether investors and human beings were risk averse. If we were all risk neutral, we collectively as human beings, we would accept the risk-free rate as our expected return in every investment, no matter how risky it is. Since we are risk averse, we will pay less for a risky expected cash, cash flow than an otherwise equivalent guaranteed cash flow. So the question at risk of, of converting risk aversion to value then becomes how do we bring that measure of uh, the, how do we measure risk and then how do we bring that risk measure into our assessment of value so that we can reduce the value of more risky assets. That's a challenge I'd like to deal with in this session. The framework that drives much of what we think about finance uh, about risk in finance is the mean variance framework. And in the mean variance framework here's what we do. As investors, we assume that the expected return on an investment is the plus and that we measure the risk in an investment by the variance in returns in that investment. You think, what are you talking about? When you invest in, in, in any asset, in a business, there is an expected return. Your actual returns, though, can be different from those expected returns. That is risk. So if you have a risk-free investment, you're essentially telling me that your expected return and your actual return are always the same. In other words, your actual return is exactly your expected return. That's a risk-free investment. A risky investment then in the mean variance framework is one where the actual returns are different from the expected return, and the more different they are, the riskier an investment becomes. You think, that sounds pretty intuitive, so what's the big deal? Here's the big deal. In the mean variance framework, we are assuming that the only two things you care about as an investor is expected return as you're good, and variance as you're bad. For that to be true, one of two things has to be true. One is that returns are normally distributed. You know what I mean by normally distributed, right? It's, it's a symmetric distribution. The great thing about the normal distribution is it can be described with two parameters, the expected return and the standard deviation, the mean variance framework. The other is, is you have a utility function. Remember we talked about utility functions as being the engines that drive risk aversion? You have a utility function that leads you to care only about expected return and standard deviation. There are some utility functions that allow it. They're very strange utility functions, but one of those two things has to be in place for you to buy into the mean variance framework. So what I'm admitting to up front is the entire framework is a little shaky because it's built on this presumption that all you care about is expected return as you're good and standard deviation slash, slash variance as you're bad. Now, having said that, though, when you think about investing in a business and you think about where the variance in actual returns is coming from in that business, you can trace that variance to lots of different fundamentals. It could be because individual investments that this company has taken have not generated the returns you'd expect. To. So if you're investing in a retail company, an individual store they might open up might not do as well or bad, uh, as well as they expect, or might do much better than expected. Think of that as project-specific risk, investments you take as a company, not delivering exactly what you expected. And remember, again, risk can be both upside and downside. It could be that you're in a business where you're, you're doing exactly what you expect to do, but your competition is acting differently. Maybe they're stronger or weaker than expected. That could affect your returns. It could be also that the entire sector is being affected by a law that's been passed, taxes that drive your sector. So it's not just you, but it's the, the entire sector, all of the companies in your sector. It could be risk that affects, you know, more than just your sector. It could be just the dollar gets stronger or weaker. That could affect not just your sector, but all sectors that are exposed to exchange rate risk. Or finally, it could be the entire, you know, it could be interest rates changing, the economy becoming stronger or weaker, in which case it's not just your company, it's every company in the market. You think, why separate risk into these groups? In a sense, what I've done is I've broken risk down into risk that affects one or a few companies, risk that affects most or all companies. That is going to be my starting point for why diversification pays off for investors. Because when you spread your bets across investments, here's what's going to happen. 
The risk that affects most all companies, interest rate risk, big macroeconomic risk is still going to be that. You cannot eliminate that risk by holding 100 stocks. But the risk that affects one or a few companies is going to average out. Think of what? It's a law of large numbers. So if you own 100 companies, for every company where a project does better than expected, another one a project could do worse than expected. That risks average out. The argument for diversification is a pretty intuitive one, which is as you spread across investments, your exposure to that firm-specific risk is going to get smaller because you're getting the law of large numbers working in your favor. In fact, there are two ways you can argue for why diversification reduces your exposure to firm-specific risk. The weaker argument is, hey, every investment is now just a smaller part of my overall portfolio, so I don't feel the pain as much. Why is that weaker? Because you still feel the pain. The much stronger argument, though, is the one that I just gave. Because as you spread across multiple companies, the risk that affects one or a few companies is going to average out. So it's not just that you feel less pain, you might not feel the pain at all because it averages out across your portfolio. So the argument for diversification is a simple one, but it can be made statistical. And there is, an, there is a benefit looking at the statistical basis for diversification. So let's take an example. Let's suppose you have two stocks. Stock one has a lower expected return and a lower standard deviation. 1.5% expected return, 10% standard deviation. Stock two has a higher expected return and a higher standard deviation. If you lived in a mean variance world, and you could pick only one stock and you were risk averse, you'd pick stock one because it's less risky. But let's assume that stock one and stock two don't always move together. And I'm going to capture that with a correlation. The correlation captures how stock one and stock two move together. And that correlation is only 0.20. If you're not familiar with correlations, correlations range from minus one to plus, plus one. If you have a correlation of plus one, you have two stocks that move in perfect sync. If you have a correlation of minus one, one they work, move in perfect sync, but in opposite directions. In this case, the correlation is plus 0.20. Now let's do some magic. Let's assume that you put half your money in stock one and half your money in stock two and ask you what the standard deviation of that portfolio is going to be. Now your first reaction might be that's easy. Stock one has a standard deviation of 10%, stock two has a standard deviation of 15%. If I put half my money in each, it should fall right down the middle, 12.5%, and you'd be wrong, and here's why. The standard deviation of the portfolio will reflect the weights you have on the two stocks, weight you know, on stock one and stock two, but it will also reflect how they move together. So if you look at the equation for the standard deviation, it's a little messy because you've got the weights and they're squared, but you take the net effect of that correlation, what you get as the, as the standard deviation of the combined portfolio, 50-50, is magical. It's magical because the standard deviation is only 9.81%. You say, what do you mean only 9.81%? I've combined two stocks which have higher standard deviations and I've ended up with a standard deviation lower than either of those stocks. That is the magic of diversification. Now, if you want to do a what if, try making the correlation once, see what happens. And you're going to see that if you make the correlation one, the standard deviation of the portfolio will end up at 12.5%. The lower I make my standard, the correlation, the greater the benefit of diversification. In fact, if I make the correlation negative, you're going to see the benefit become even larger. Now, this is the basis for diversification, and you can extend it from, so basically, this was for two assets. You can extend it to three, to four. There's a, there's a mechanical challenge you're going to face because as the number of assets goes from two to three, you now have to calculate the correlation between, one and, between asset one and asset two, asset one and three, and two and three. There are three correlations. As you go to four, you, what you're going to see is the number of correlations is going to start increasing exponentially as you go from two to three to four to five to a hundred stocks. You can still do it or a computer can do it but here's what you're also going to discover as you keep adding stocks to your portfolio as you go from two to three to four to five the marginal benefit of adding the next stock will start to get smaller and smaller. The benefit of adding the 51st stock to your portfolio will be smaller than the benefit of the second stock was or the benefit of the 11th stock was, the marginal benefits will get smaller. They will never disappear. They will never drop below zero, but they will get smaller and smaller. And here's where finance makes its first introduction. The notion that diversification is a good thing is age-old. Remember the old proverbs, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Finance introduces the notion of a marginal investor. And this is particularly in the context 
context of a publicly traded company with thousands of potential investors holding its shares. The marginal investor in a company is the investor who sets prices, who has an influence in prices. And to be able to influence prices, think of what you need. You need to own a lot of shares. If I own a thousand shares in Apple, my buying or selling Apple has no effect on its price. So you need to own a lot of shares and you need to trade those shares. So marginal investor in a company is somebody who owns a lot of stock in the company and trades those shares. Since you need to trade the shares, it means that the biggest investor in a company might not be the marginal investor. So Larry Ellison might be the largest stockholder in Oracle. He owns 20% plus of the company, but he's not the marginal investor because he doesn't trade those shares. And I think, so what? If you look at most companies, even mid-cap companies, even small companies, you look at the kinds of investors who own a lot of shares and trade those shares, those investors tend to be institutional investors. And in finance, we make the assumption that the marginal investors in most publicly traded companies are diversified investors. You think, what does that change? Remember what we just said, where as you diversify, the way you think about risk changes because the risk of a stock then, because the risk that it adds to your portfolio. In fact, when you look at the very first risk and return model that acquired dominance in finance, the capital asset pricing model, it's built on the presumption that there are no transactions costs and that you can't pick stocks. And if I make those two assumptions, you will never stop diversifying. In fact, by the time you're done, you will own every single traded asset in the market in your portfolio. We call that the market portfolio. It sounds absurd, but without transactions costs and without having some counterweight, remember the benefit to diversification continues to be positive even for the 41st, uh, th the 40,000 plus one stock that you put in. So that portfolio it will include every single traded asset. You think, so what? In the capital asset pricing model, once you come to the conclusion that you should diversify and should hold the market portfolio. The risk of an asset then becomes a risk that it adds to that market portfolio. In fact, in the capital asset pricing model, when you look at across investors, you're saying, where would I show different degrees of risk aversion? My neighbor wants to take no risk. I want to take some risk. My next door neighbor wants to take even more risk. If we all hold the market portfolio, what's going to set us apart? The answer is very simply how much money you put into the market portfolio and how much you leave in a riskless investment. Your neighbor wants to take no risk, will put all of his, his or her money in the riskless asset. You might put half your money in the market portfolio. Think of it as a gigantic index fund of every traded asset and half of it in the riskless asset. Your next door neighbor wants to take even more risk, might put all his of her or her money into the market portfolio. And the neighbor next to him or her who wants to take even more risk, you know how they'll take risk? They would go out and borrow money and by the same market portfolio, we all will end up holding only two assets, a riskless asset and this gigantic index fund of every traded risky asset in the world that we call the market portfolio. It changes the way we think about risk because now when I ask you how risky a stock is, Disney, uh, Tesla, you name the company, I'm going to measure that risk by the risk it adds to the market portfolio because that's what I own. And statistically, I'm going to capture that risk with how the stock moves with the market portfolio. We, ca we call this the covariance, but it's, ve it's a very close relationship, the correlation we talked about. So the more an asset covaries with the market, the riskier it becomes. And we standardize this covariance by dividing by the variance of the market simply because we want a standardized number. The covariance by itself is a number like 37%, 45%. Zero. Is that high? Is that low? We divide every covariance by the variance of the market. And we, when we do that, we end up with a beta for a stock or a beta for an asset. And in the capital asset pricing model, that becomes your measure of the risk of an asset. And in fact, if you buy into all of the assumptions you made in the capital asset pricing model, the beta then becomes a measure of the risk in an asset, a risk in an investment, and your expected return can then be written as a risk-free rate. That's what you would demand for a guaranteed investment, plus a risk premium that's a function of two things. The beta of the investment, which is the standardized measure of risk added to a portfolio, and the risk premium you demand for an average risk investment. That becomes your expected return magical, right? But think about all the baggage you had to carry along the way. The CAPM is built on some very, very strong assumptions. It does give us this great model where all you need is one number, a beta, to capture the risk of a stock. 
But people have always known its limitations and they've tried to adjust adjust for them. The early versions of the CAPM just try to modify assumptions. They brought in taxes or transactions costs and what would happen to the model. Later versions, they extended the CAPM. In what way? Remember in the CAPM, the fundamental intuition is that you get rewarded only for risk you cannot diversify away, but we capture that ex uh, the exposure to that risk with one number of beta. So in the extended versions, especially in the first version of the extended version, which is called the arbitrage pricing model, you allow for multiple sources of market risk. It's still staying with the market risk concept, risk you cannot diversify, but you now have multiple sources and a beta against each one. The weakness of the arbitrage pricing model is those multiple market risk factors didn't have names. There were statistical factors. They were called factor one, factor two, factor three, etc. In later versions of these multi-factor models, you put macroeconomic names in the factors, level of interest rates, term structure. Essentially, you're building an expanded version of what you had in the CAPM, allowing for betas against different market risk factors. In the last 25 years, as we've had access to more data, there's a third approach that's been tried, which, are, which I you know, roughly call proxy models. In a proxy model, here's what you do. You look for characteristics of companies that have earned high returns in the past. So for instance, if you look at the last 50, 60, 70 years of returns, you find that small market cap companies earn higher returns than large market cap companies. Then you make a leap of faith. You then argue that small companies must be riskier than larger companies. Now do you see why I call these proxy models? You're letting market capitalization of the company stand in as a proxy for risk. In the last 25 years, as we've dug through the data, we've been able to find more and more proxies. So when you look at risk and return models in finance, you're either going to see the CAPM, you're going to see a modified version of the CAPM, an extended version of the CAPM, a proxy model, or some combination. In fact, um, you could see a cap, the, uh, the traditional CAPM with the market cap proxy for risk thrown in as well. Every risk and return model in finance was born from that initial foray into the mean variance framework. So here's the bottom line. When you look across these risk and return models and your eyes glaze over because you get caught up in the statistical betas, here's what I want you to remember. Not all risk counts. So when you invest in an asset and you're exposed to risk, don't get expect to get rewarded for all that risk because as long as there are marginal investors in that stock who price the stock based on a different perception of risk, you have to play their game. That's why when we value companies, we don't look at risk through our own eyes. We look at risk through the eyes of the marginal investor because they're the ones who set prices. And to the extent that those marginal investors are diversified, we use risk measures that reflect diversification. So the fact that you and I might not be diversified doesn't mean we can use risk and return models that reflect absence of diversification because there are marginal investors out there who are diversified. And the diversification effect does mean that the risk we focus on, that we bring into our risk measures and our risk premiums, might be only a portion of the risk you see in an investment. It's a risk that you cannot diversify away. Now this page has a lot of stuff in it, but when you get a chance, go through it. It actually looks at how our thinking on risk has evolved through time. Okay? Because until the, the 1500s, we didn't even have a measure, of, we didn't have probabilities. Without probabilities, you can't even start thinking about risk. So the starting point for the way we think about risk goes back to the first measures of probability, which then fed into insurance, and then insurance fed into price variance, and the financial markets gave us ratings, and then you had variance as a measure of risk, and then you had the Markowitz revolution. That's the 1950s where finance was born, where the key insight was that you don't get rewarded for all the risk you get exposed to because you can diversify away some of that risk. And then in the last 30 or 40 years, the availability of data has allowed us to expand these models to bring in multi-factor models and proxy models. But in, in one page, this is the history of how we've thought about risk in finance. So risk matters. Measuring risk is key. We have to make assumptions, and some of those assumptions might make you uncomfortable to measure risk. But without a measure of risk, we're going to be lost in finance.